All right, hope everyone is doing okay. Um, so sorry that we're starting slightly late. Uh, I just had dry erase board pens stop functioning last lecture. So just went and procured some new ones that hopefully will uh, have a longer shelf life than the prior ones. Um, so look, today uh, we're gonna do one thing. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're going to apply the static replication approach to valuing a corporate project but instead of doing it with a really simple project like we did at the end of last lecture uh, instead uh, what we're going to do is um, we're going to use the exact same technique the exact same procedure to value a far more complicated yet still realistic project um, and what you guys are going to see from um, from going through the experience of solving this problem is um, by far the most difficult part of this exercise is going to be figuring out what the payoff diagrams associated with future cash flows on the project are. Once you have the payoff diagrams, because they're still going to be piecewise linear with jumps and drops, everything else will be you know, just like we had done with the financial derivative, just like we had done with, um, with the simpler exercise that we did last lecture, right? So it's really gonna be like the first part of the problem that's gonna be really difficult. Um, and honestly, even after you see me do it, it'll still be difficult for you. If I give you a different problem, you will still struggle with it. It's gonna be the kind of thing where it really helps to, to, to have some practice. And indeed, I'm going to give you guys plenty of practice problems. I'll give you guys two problems, probably one simpler one and one tougher one in the homework. But if you look at the practice finals, you've got at least two other problems like that. Uh, you may even have more. I just don't remember how many I put. Um, and so this is definitely going to be the kind of thing where um, practice, I mean, maybe practice doesn't even make perfect, but practice makes reasonably decent, um, which then puts you way ahead of most people, by the way. Um, so that's going to be our goal for today is just really kind of uh, expose you guys to kind of the, the thought process, both intuitive and quantitative, that goes into figuring out a payoff diagram. That's the part that's overwhelming for most people when they see this. And then um, the other parts, hopefully, even if your head is a little bit spinning after the payoff diagram part, you're able to at least see that like the rest of it is kind of mechanical, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, what we're gonna do is uh, I'm first gonna read the problem. The problem is bonus exercise one in lecture note two, part two. So that's on slide 12. So let me just go ahead and share my slide for that. So I'll read it and then I'll exit the share screen, come back to this full, you know, thing where we're going to be doing stuff on the board. Okay. Um, there's a reasonable amount of information in the problem. So, you know, I do recommend that um, if you're, you know, live right now, or if you're watching it as a recording later on, that, um, you either try to have like your slide open on the side so that you can remember what different things were so that you can make sense of the, the stuff I'm doing on the board. Or if you've printed it out, that's equivalent as far as I'm concerned. Um, but that probably helps. Um, but yeah, so let's go ahead. I'll, I'll, share, the, I'll share the slide now. Uh, slide share. Can you guys see my slides now? Okay, good. So this is the setting. Um, you're thinking, you're, you're a company uh, that makes jewelry, and you're thinking of doing a new project, which is launching a new line of jewelry. The line would consist of uh, gold rings uh, that you currently, when I say currently, I mean at time zero, would sell for 350 per ring. An important input in the, uh, well, this is perhaps not a surprise, an important input in the, in the production of gold rings is gold. Um, and in particular, each ring requires 0.15 ounces of gold for production. 
uh, the price currently for gold is 1600 per ounce. And the volatility of gold prices is 36% per year. There's a nerdy little statement in brackets that says expressed as a continuously compounded rate. That just means the 0.36 is the number you would put for volatility in the Black-Scholes model. That's all that means, okay? Um, other costs in the production process include uh, miscellaneous materials used in production because a gold ring isn't pure gold. Um, so stuff like nickel. Um, I did Google that to find out what goes into a gold ring. Um, labor expenses, uh, marketing expenses, those things combined um, are relatively constant as costs and they're equal to $100 per ring. Okay, so that kind of describes what goes into a ring. And look, the, the main source of uncertainty in the price of producing a gold ring is gold because gold is actually fairly volatile in terms of its price. Now, some other information about our company. Our company currently has unused capacity at its manufacturing facility. In other words, we've got some unused machines that could be used to produce 10,000 of those gold rings per year. If we wanna produce more than 10,000, something's gotta give. And in particular, if we wanna produce more, if we wanna produce, for instance, 20,000 rings, um, we need to stop producing some other stuff that we're producing to use those machines to produce the gold rings. The other stuff we would stop producing generates $250,000 a year in, uh, in profits. So, um, you know, that's something to think about if we're going to start shutting down other production. Um, you know, we want to ask ourselves, is it, is, is it profitable enough to, to produce these rings to justify doing that? Make sense so far? Yes, no, maybe? Um, Look, it's going to turn out in this, and this is going to be the source of flexibility in this project, is that at every point in time, um, this company can decide how much of the rings to produce. And they're able to like shift their product production from one thing to another. So that's every, every it's not like if they choose to produce 10,000 now, they need to produce 10,000 again next year. They can literally swap back and forth to any level anytime they want. Right, so a very agile manufacturing process. By the way, this stuff happens in the real world, right? You do have some production facilities that are set up to basically switch from producing A to producing B, depending on what the relative price and cost of producing A and selling A versus ditto for B kind of is happening, right? And that's, by the way, a source of flexibility. And that's going to be the main flexibility that we model in this problem. It's that flexibility to scale up and scale down our production of these gold rings. Right? So as I say, you can move back and forth between these production levels period by period. Um, for simplicity in this problem, we'll only have two periods, time zero and time one. But what we do in terms of solving this, I could give you the problem where there's time zero, one, two, and three. You'd still be able to use the same process that I do, do here. It just would take you much longer because the stuff I do for the cash flows at time one, which is gonna be a payoff diagram for the cash flows at time one, you'd have to do that for time two and time three as well. So it's just more work, but the process is the same. Now, as a final consideration in this setup, you have been promised by a large jewelry retailer that it will purchase the entire supply that you produce at year one. You can decide the amount you produce at that time, including producing nothing for $400 per unit, so per ring, if you produce the rings in non-zero quantity right now, so 10,000 or 20,000. And the price of gold uh, is above 1700. So this, this extra 50 bucks per ring from 350 to 400 only happens if gold prices are high enough. If they hit this trigger threshold of 1700, if they're 1699 and 99 cents, too bad sucker. You're still selling them for 350. Okay. Um, 
right? If gold prices are below that, you can still only sell them for 350. That's what I mean. I threw in the little sucker statement there just for fun um, to keep it interesting because I'm teaching this three times today. Uh, keep in mind that you always maintain the option to produce no rings at year one despite the retailer's offer. Right, so that's the lay of the land on the project. Some other closing statements that are gonna be useful for us when we use the Black Shoals model later on are things like throughout this problem, assume that the jewelry line only exists for two periods, year zero and one. As a result, you do not need to consider any potential profits after year one. Also assume that the riskless rate equals 5% expressed as a continuously compounded rate, just nerdy thing because the R for the riskless rate in the Black-Scholes formula is continuously compounded, just so you know. Um, and the firm pays, uh, pays no taxes. Uh, maybe owned by Donald Trump, who knows. Uh, given the flexibility in production, quantity and the, contra uh, and the contract with the retailer, um, what is the value of creating a new line of jewelry? Right? What is the value of this project? But we don't want to do this NPV style. We want to do it real option analysis style where we're properly valuing the fact that there's this flexibility embedded in the contract, that, uh, not in the contract, but in the project and the contract that uh, make this whole thing a little bit more valuable. Okay? So... Yeah, let's, um, let's go ahead and solve this problem. I'm just gonna stop sharing my slide. You guys are back to seeing me in full screen, correct? Okay. Um, yeah, so before I start doing things on the board, I wanna kind of explain a little bit of intuition on the problem because like when I, when I make sense of a project, before I start doing math, I try to get a handle on the project because it'll make me make my life a lot easier when I go to try to solve the math. Now this is the kind of thing that, that uh, is easier once you have a lot of practice, to be honest. So I'm going to give you guys intuition, but when you guys try to come up with your own intuition, a problem, you may find it very difficult to do. And if you do, that's normal. So don't get too discouraged. Um, but again, because it helps, I'm going to just highlight it here. Um, in a project like this, what I try to figure out first is what is the flexibility in the project? And the flexibility in the project here is the ability to choose your quantity and production at time one, not today, but at time one, depending on what gold prices are at time one. So that I don't need to lock in and commit right now, right? That would be no flexibility if I was committed right now. That would be D DCF world. No, instead, I can just wait till later, see whether gold prices are high or low, and then decide. Do I want gold prices to be low or do I want gold prices to be high? I would like them to be low, right? Because it's an input cost. The only weird thing is we can also probably see that if I have a choice between 16.99 and 99 cents versus 1700, even though 1700 is a little bit bigger than 16.99 and 99 cents, I probably want it to be 1700 because then I get the extra kicker of $50 per ring in the price per ring that the retailer pays. Right? So there's flexibility in production because of the more agile production facility that the manufacturer has, but there's also a discontinuity in the price of the ring where I get to sell at 1700, which also creates this other factor where like, I might stop producing at 1699, but start producing again at 1700. And by the way, um, just to preview things, but you may not understand it as I say it right now, um, the ability to switch production from like, zero to 10,000 to 20,000, that's gonna create kinks in my payoff diagram, so changes in slope. The discontinuity in price is gonna create a jump. 
And that's why we're going to have a curve that is piecewise linear with jumps. So that just gives us a sense of where we're going. But what I'm recognizing here is I need to analyze the cases where gold price are below 1700 and above 1700 separately because they're slightly different decisions. In one case, you're selling stuff for 350. In another case, you're selling it for 400. So decisions change. So I'm going to analyze below 1700 and above 1700 separately. And then within each of those scenarios, I'm going to compare, is it better to produce zero, better to produce 10,000, or better to produce 20,000? Because that's the agility in manufacturing. Folks OK with this? All right, so let's go ahead and, and, and solve this. So I'm going to stop sharing my, oh, I've already stopped sharing my screen, correct? OK. Look, um, the tough part of this problem is analyzing what our cash flows look like at time one. Um, this project, as I said, has two periods, time zero and time one. So let's start with the easier thing. The easier thing is to analyze time one. Uh, sorry, time zero. So let's take a look. Time zero. Because at time zero, I also have the agility to be able to choose to produce zero, 10,000, or 20,000. So look, all I'm going to do is I'm going to compare how much money, how much cash flow I make in each case. Right? So three possibilities. If I produce at time zero, zero, what's my cash flow at time zero? Someone want to just tell me? It's not a trick question. Zero, right? I produce nothing, I spend nothing, you know, kind of like. Kind of like I never showed up. Zero. What if I produce 10,000, 10K? Well, my cash flow at time zero is what? 10,000 times, well, it's just, you know, price per ring minus cost per ring. So 350 minus 100 for all the non-gold costs, minus 0.15 ounces um, times the price of gold right now. What was the price of gold right now? It was 1,600, I think. 1,600. So if we do the math, that gives us 100,000. Because this is 240. 350 minus 100 minus 240 is 10. So we make $10 in profit per ring, 10,000 rings, that's $100,000. What about if we produce 20K? $20,000 times 350 minus 100 minus 0.15 times 1,600, same as before, but we also need to subtract the opportunity cost of, of, of producing 20,000, which is um, we no longer produce that other line of jewelry and we lose 250K because of that. That needs to be tacked on as a, as a cost, right? Because remember, when we say cash flow, it's really incremental cash flow, right? So minus 250K. And so we do this, we get minus 50,000. So what's the best thing for us to do today? Pretty clear, best thing for us to do today is to produce 10,000 because we make 100K in profit. That's the best of the three options. So we know this is what we go for. This is what gives us our smiley face. Okay, so we're done analyzing 
time zero. I actually put the time zero there uh, because that's something that I felt everyone would be comfortable doing, right? And the thing is, once you've done this, it's actually easier for you to solve the rest of the problem because you start to get a handle for what you're going to be doing quantitatively um, in terms of getting payoff functions um, at time one. So this is our time zero. Now let's go to time one. Um, this is going to be our payoff diagram. When I say analyze time one, because it's in the future, I really mean figure out cash flow at time one as a payoff diagram, which is a function of the underlying. What's the underlying in this problem? Gold, correct? So we're going to figure out what is cash flow at time one as a function of gold price at time one. And as I said, there's a discontinuity at 1700 because below gold price 1700, right? We uh, only get paid 350 per ring. Above 1700, we get paid 400 per ring. Whereas below 1700, we get paid 350 per ring. So I'm going to analyze both scenarios separately. I'll start with the scenario where the rings, we get to sell them for 350. Sound good? So let's go with that, right? Um, scenario one. Gold price at time one, less than 1700, i.e. ring price is 350. Now what I'm going to do is I'm gonna still look at my three options. My three options are produce zero, produce 10K, or produce 20K. And what I'll do is I'll find out um, what is cash flow as a function of gold price in each separate scenario. So what is cash flow? So if Q1, that's the quantity at time one, if that's equal to zero, cash flow at time one in scenario one is equal to what? Just zero still, because I'm still producing nothing. Let's call this the, uh, the red curve. And then what if quantity at time one is equal to 10K? In that case, cash flow at time one is equal to what? It's equal to 10,000, right? It looks a lot like what we did here. The only thing is now we don't know what gold price is, so we leave it as a variable. So 10,000 times 350 minus 100 minus 0 0.15, but now it's time times G1, because it's as a function of G1. Remember, a payoff diagram is a function of the X variable, G1. So that gives us 2.5 million minus 1,500 G1. And I will call this, I will call this the uh, green curve. Now we've got Q1 equal to 20K. That's our third possibility. Third possibility, then we have cash flow one equals to 20,000 times 350 minus 100 minus 0.15 times G1, but now minus the 250,000 
opportunity cost, which gives us um, 4.75 million minus 3,000 G1. And I'll call this the blue curve. These are three relatively simple functions of G1. And for any given G1, we pick the highest number of those three options. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna trace out the three curves right now, right? Our red line was what? Our red line is just equal to zero. So this is the equals to zero case. This is if we produce zero. Now I'm gonna go and trace out the, um, the uh, next case, which was uh, 10K production. It's got an intercept of 2.5 million. And it's got a slope of minus 1,500. So slope minus 1,500. And then the final one, our blue line, that was the quantity is equal to uh, 20,000. That was 4.75 million. And it had a slope of minus 3,000. Now, what do you do? When you, you, at time one, if gold prices are equal to whatever this number is here, you say to yourself, if I produce 20,000, I get this much cash flow, that's not good, I'm losing money. Or I can produce nothing, I break even. Or I can produce 10,000. Uh, 10, oh, well, pretty clearly I produced 10,000, correct? But if you look at this picture, then all I need to do is for every level of G1, I pick the highest curve. So visually we can see the highest curve is what? It's my little jagged line, my jagged black line here. Like that. Uh, where the slope here was minus 3000. What do we need to figure out? It's very important for us to know where is this break point and where is this break point? Because that tells us where our changes in slopes are happening in the payoff diagram. Is everyone okay with that statement? Yes or no? So I'll assume that was a yes. Um, how do we find these break points? I'll call this first break point G1 star, and I'll call the second one G1 double star. Now, if I know what those numbers are, and I know that gold prices are below G1 star, how much should I produce? If I know gold prices are below this level, how much should I produce? 20,000. Correct, 20,000, because that's the highest one. If it's above G1 star, but below G1 double star, between these two numbers, how much should I produce? 10,000. 10,000. And if it's above that, but below 1,700, how much should I produce? Zero. Zero. You're exactly right. By the way, I want to highlight that this actually kind of makes sense. We'll figure out whatever, whatever those numbers are, G1 star and G, G1 double star. But notice the following. If gold prices are low enough, Producing gold rings is so profitable that you should produce as much as you can. You should produce 20,000, which is why when G1 is below a certain threshold, you produce 20K. But once gold prices become high enough, 
it's still profitable to produce gold rings, but it's not profitable enough that you want to give up the production of your other profitable line. Right? If per unit you, you make 20 bucks in profit from the other line, and in this line of gold, you make $15 profit, you don't want to give up that other production, but you still want to produce the gold rings with your unused capacity because it's better to generate 15 than zero. See what I'm saying? And that's why once gold prices get high enough, but not too high, we now produce 10,000. We still want to produce from unused capacity, but we don't want to switch from other capacity into this. That's the intuition. And then what happens when gold prices are high enough? Don't produce it. If gold prices are infinity, don't sell gold rings. Unless you can sell them for more than infinity. Right? So um, that's kind of what's happening here. So let's go and figure out what G1 star and G, G1 double star are. So for G1, G1 single star, does someone want to tell me which equation I want to solve? It's an equation that just sets two lines equal to each other. So it's stuff you guys probably saw like, what, seventh or eighth grade, right? So you guys are familiar with this. I know that. So what, what equation would I solve here? You set the red curve and the green curve equal to each other? Red and, and the green black curve, or the blue curve and the green curve. Yes, exactly, right? This is where it becomes equally profitable to produce 10,000 and 20,000 which means 20,000 was blue, 10,000 was green. We set green equal to blue. So 4.75 million minus 3,000 G1 equals to 2.5 million minus 1,500 G1. And now we just do the algebra. Two point two five million divided by one thousand five hundred. That gives us fifteen hundred. So G one star is equal to fifteen hundred. What about G one double star? Someone want to tell me which what equation I set up? Where the green uh, curve equals the red curve, which is zero. That's right. Exactly. So green. Green line equals red line, boom. This equals this. So that's 2.5 million minus 1,500 G1 equals to zero. And that's just G1 equals 2.5 million over 1,500, which is equal to 1,666.67. 16. 16 1666.67. By the way, there's something I want to highlight about what we've just done. We figured out our payoff diagram in scenario one. For, so for everything where gold price is below 1700. But in doing this, we've also found out what our optimal production strategy is, right? Because we've found out if gold prices are below 1500, the best thing to do is to set Q1 equal to zero. Uh, sorry, equal to 20,000. Q1 star, the star here means optimal. And if gold prices are below 1666.67, but above 1500, the optimal production is what? 10,000. And if gold prices are between 1666.67 and 1700, the optimal production is zero. That is the, so notice in solving this problem, we're not just going to value our project. We are going to determine the optimal manufacturing strategy, right? The manufacturing strategy that generates the most value possible, which I think is kind of cool. Folks okay with this so far? 
Well, it's given that I see zero faces, this is a bit of a challenge. But the one image I see person looks pretty happy. So at one point in your life, you were happy, but I think that was taken be before I started teaching you this. So I can't draw much inference from that. All right, good. I see some faces now. Thank you very much. Um, so far, so good? Okay, good. Um, by the way, here's some good news. We have these two scenarios. The math in the two scenarios is really, really close to each other. So I wrote down scenario one here, but uh, not, not where I'm pointing here, but like here, right? Um, doing scenario two doesn't mean reinventing the wheel. It means going through our old math and deleting a couple of numbers and replacing them with a different one. So mathematically, we're doing the same thing. So I'm just gonna go and do that here. I'm gonna say, now we're doing scenario two, where gold prices are greater or equal to 1,700. If we produce nothing, it's still zero. If we produce 10,000 though, we're no longer selling the rings at 350, we're selling them at 400. That is the only number that changes there. And so that means when we do the math, we now have 3,000, sorry, 3 million minus 1,500 G1. What about if we produce 20K? Again, the only number that changes is 350 to 400, which then brings us up to 5.75 million if you do the math. And so now we're gonna go and figure out G1 triple star and G1 quadruple star, where all we're doing is we're just changing the same numbers. So look, I might be zipping through this a little bit quick for you. Um, if it's too quick for you, rather than slowing down here, I think the better thing for you is work through this part independently outside of this lecture and get yourself to the point where you get why I'm doing these changes and why I'm telling you that actually you can do them pretty quickly when you're comfortable with this. That to me is the best way to go for like learning purposes, okay? Um, so we've got this. So now I do the math, that's a 2.75 million equals 1,500 G1. 2.75 million divided by 1,500 is now 1,833.33. And then for G, uh, G1, quadruple star, it was 3 million. Again, where does this 3 million come from? It comes from here. Equals, well, zero, so 3 million, so that one's easy. That gives me 2,000. So I know I've got G1 triple star equals 1833.33 G1 quadruple star equals 2000. By the way, I'm not gonna draw out the three curves like I did last time because I already know it's gonna kind of look like this. It's just gonna be shifted to the right now. The only thing I need to figure out, I know there's gonna be a jump at 1700 because at 1700, I'm gonna go from producing nothing and making no money to producing 20,000 again, right? I'm gonna produce 20,000 again, because remember, G1 triple star is when we switch from producing 20,000 to producing 10,000. Since that's happening at a number, 1833.33, that is above 1,700, that means automatically that at 1,700, I'm producing 20,000. That's just a logical fact. So then the question becomes, what is the level of this curve when we produce 20K at G1 equals 1700. So at G1 equals 1700, cash flow at time one is equal to what? Well, we know from this that we're producing 20K. So 20,000, well, we're producing 20K and that gives us 5.75 million minus 3,000 G1. So 5.75 million minus 3,000 times G1, but G1 is 1,700. Well, 3,000 times 1,700, that's 5.1 million. 
So 5.75 million minus 5.1 million is 650,000. What does this mean? It means at, seven, at, at a gold price of exactly 1,700, because I can sell the rings at 400, I will be producing 20,000 and I will make profits of 650,000. So, Six hundred fifty thousand This is actually tough for me to draw, sorry. By the way, you'll notice I'm not drawing greatly at scale. No one will conf oh my lord, this is so bad. Um and let's go like this. Let's give it a little bit more of a curve like that, and then I'll call this six hundred fifty thousand. This is not, this is really bad in terms of drawing at scale. It's because I'm not an artist, okay? Um, if you do this on a final exam, you do not need to draw it at scale either. It just needs to be comprehensible, okay? Um, but all I'm saying is here, we've got a jump of plus 650,000, and then the slope. goes back to minus 3,000, then at 1833.33, it goes to minus 1,500, and then at 2,000, the slope goes to zero. And this is our payoff diagram. And by the way, we also find out here that for gold prices at time one between 1,700 and 1833.33, we're producing 20,000 again, right? So Q1 star equals 20K. And then from 1833.33 to 2000, we're producing 10K rings again. So Q1 star equals 10K. And then all the way above 2000, we're back to producing nothing. Any questions about this? Right, like, look, if you're like, you know, each step kind of looks like it would be doable, but in totality, this seems like a, a, a very challenging thing to do. Um, um, that's normal. Again, I just want to reemphasize, this is the kind of thing where you need practice. By the way, some of you guys are looking at this, they're like, oh, that looks pretty easy. And then I'll give you a problem. You'll be like, oh, shit. <laughs> so that's normal too, by the way, right? So this is by far the toughest part of the exercise. But this is the toughest quantity. This is the toughest quantitative thing that you do bar none anywhere in my course, period. And it's, 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 like, it's like number one by like a legit margin. Okay, and look, why do I know this? Empirically, every year when I give this problem on a final, not this, this problem, but like a problem of this class, um, it's the problem that people struggle with the most in, um, they struggle with the most. It's also the problem that if someone gets a perfect score on that problem, it's been the best predictor of like how well they do in their career. Because um, um, it's pretty rare that someone gets a perfect, score on this problem, uh, but it has happened. Um, and um, anyway, for, I don't know why I said this. It just popped in my head. I was like, oh, that is actually true. Um, but in any case, um, the rest of this problem, right? Because this is just, what have we done here? We've gotten our payoff diagram for the, the time one cash flows of this project. Do we all understand that? Right. This is what this is the profile of profitability for the project at time one as a function of gold prices at time one. If we execute on the manufacturing strategy the right way. To figure out what the value of the 
time one cash flows for this project is, right? Present value of cash flow one. We just need to take this payoff diagram and do the two steps that we've already talked about. Replicate, then value the replicating portfolio. And since we have an algorithm for doing all of that stuff, those two steps are much easier. So it's really hard to get this right. But once you have this, getting everything else right, conditional on this answer, is, is much easier. Are we on the same page there? And we'll actually do it in a second. Sound good? Right? So we'll do it in two steps. You know, we'll look at this and we'll figure out the recipe list, right? Which I call the replicating portfolio, where we'll replicate this with a portfolio of riskless zero coupon bond. The underlying, what is the underlying here? What is the underlying asset in all of this? Not a trick question. It's always the x-axis. What's the x-axis? Gold. Gold. Yeah, so the underlying asset here is gold. Um, so we're going to use riskless zero coupon bond, position in the underlying asset gold, and then a bunch of call options and CNBCs on gold to replicate this. And then once we have the replicating portfolio, we'll use the Black-Scholes template to figure out what the price of all those calls and CNBCs are to try to guesstimate what the value of this thing today is. And Joe, that, quick question. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, when building the replicating portfolio, do you ever use put options? Is there ever a scenario where put options are used or it's mainly just shorting and longing different calls? So, look, I'm going to give you my, my, uh, my perspective on this. My perspective is replicate from left to right using only, only, only riskless zero coupon bond underlying calls and CNBCs. So do not use puts. Um, it is possible for you to use a put to do this, except that when you use a put, you're not replicating from left to right. You're replicating from right to left. Right? Um, and it's tough to start at infinity. Right? Meaning that when you want to use puts, you kind of pick a point in the middle and you use puts to replicate from the left of the middle and to replicate from the right of the middle, you do what I told you to do. And I've seen this done in practice. The probability that someone makes a mistake when they do that is at least 10 times higher than the probability that you make a mistake if you just start all the way from the left, go right, and just use calls, CNBCs, underlying, and riskless zero coupon bond. So my view is the algorithm, the way I presented it to you, is more like fault tolerant. But it is possible to use puts. Okay. Um, you know, before we actually do those other steps, replication and valuation, there is one thing that I want to say. Um, because I know like it happens every year. Uh, where like some folks are really frustrated that they have to do this. They're like, you know, this is hard. How dare you? Yeah. Um, like, I just think that's a bad way to think. And uh, let me explain to you why. Um, this is the stuff that most people can't do well. And since most people can't do this part well, it's more of a unique skill to you if you're good at doing it. The things that you guys have seen in this course that are easy, well, by virtue of the fact that they're easy, they become commodity skills. There's a lot of people who can solve those problems. And I've always found it to be important that I have some unique skills. There's a basic econ 101, which is the following. Um, if you're really good at a commodity skill, you're not going to get a big wage premium for it. Because a lot of other people can do it. So it's not like you can say, hey, you know, I'm good at this, uh, bid up my wages, because people are going to be like, hey, fuck you, I can go hire someone else. Uh, you know, there's a lot of supply of this talent. So no, no, I'm not bidding for you, you're bidding for me. Right? If you're good at a commodity skill, it gets you access to the job. It doesn't give you the ability to like negotiate up your wage. 
if you're uniquely valuable, all of a sudden you are the monopolist. If people want that unique value proposition, they have to come to you. And now you can say, give me your best bid because you've got a few people bidding for you. And so being good at the stuff that is hard, that requires you to actually spend real time to think about it, that's not immediately understood the first time you see it, so long as you believe that it's actually valuable in the real world, that it actually helps make better decisions, it's worthwhile to spend the time on that stuff because it makes you uniquely valuable. It transforms you from being a, a laborer in a perfectly competitive labor market to you know, a guru in a more monopolistic expert market. And by the way, that is why I think the people who did really, really well on this question end up doing very, very well in their careers. It's not actually necessarily because this is so damn valuable. It's because the people who spend the time to do that will probably spend the time to become uniquely valuable in many other ways. And that pays off in your career. So anyway, it was my two, th my two cents, right? Um, you know, hard things can be very, so long as you work hard on the right, right, uh, right not the wrong, the right stuff, um, you know, it, it, you, will, you will be rewarded for it, right? Now, of course, you know, if your view is like, sure, but I think this is not that valuable, like, okay, fine, you know, it's okay. We can agree to disagree. Um, you know, I will say one thing. If you totally tank this part of like the final exam problem, it will not be like, detriment like super detrimental to your final grade to be honest in all expectation because everyone's doing the same problem and even after i said what i just said i know most folks aren't going to put in all the work necessary to become really really good at it so they'll lose points almost surely on this part of the problem by the way if you lose points on this part of the problem but every other part part two and part three replication and valuation you do those parts right conditional on your air I'm not gonna like penalize you more and more. So I'll give you credit for the parts you did well, and I'll just penalize you for screwing that up on this part. Uh, in the real world, you get penalized upon penalty upon penalty because you lose more and more money for your company every step of the way. But um, um, you know, in Planet you know, ACF final exam McGill, um, I don't compound errors like that. Right, so my point is like, I'm telling you all this, it's not so much about your grade in this course, right? It's just more about what I think is best for you in the long run. Um, you know, I think realistically, if you know how to do the next two steps that we're gonna do next, and you kind of tank this part, you know, maybe it'll, you know, take your grade, it will either not change it, or it'll take it down like one third of a grade, right? So like an A to an A minus or something like that. Like just realistically, traditionally, that's been what happens, right? So I don't want you guys to feel this like crazy intense pressure to like become gurus at this if, if that would force you to make tremendous sacrifice in other areas. Like it won't matter that much. Um, but my point is that like, don't not do it just because it's hard. Like it's worth practicing. I know, I'll probably belaboring the point here, but you know, just kind of going on the basis of you know what I've uh, um, you know it's not been obvious to me that people have uh, have uh, viewed this as like a positive thing to invest in. And my view is it unambiguously is. Um, again, like there's no doubt. I, I think one of the problems I'm going to give in homework too. I'm just kind of deciding right now on the fly is I'll actually have you guys, for this same problem, I'll have you guys figure out what the value of the project is if there's no flexibility. So that if you have to choose the quantity today and stick to it, and I'll have you guys compare the value of that with the value of what we're gonna get here. And you guys are gonna see the value is gonna go down by a material amount. And what that shows you is that flexibility adds value. So that if you know how to do this well, it gives you a sense of how much value you can add to your organization. So I think that'll be a nice comparison. So I'll put that probably as problem one in homework two. Okay? Uh, you guys will get homework two beginning of next week.
Sound good? All right, so let's do the rest of this problem now. Rest of this problem um, is mechanical. So long as you understand the algorithms that we covered last week, it is actually mechanical. And so this falls into the whole commodity scale thing. Like, I don't think what we're doing now, what we're gonna be doing now, it's a source of advantage for you relative to people who are like wanting to go into finance but are averse to any math. But within the sub-segment of financial services where people are willing to do semi-sophisticated math stuff, you're not special if you're able to do the last two steps. But even within that group, you're special if you can do this really well, okay? All right, do you guys want to help me with the replicating portfolio? Because it is an algorithm. So remember I said we uh, replicate from left to right. Now, just so you know, this level right here is 4.75 million. So replicating portfolio. Portfolio for the cash flows at time one. What's the first ingredient? Someone want to tell me? Remember, the first thing we do is we match the intercept. The intercept is what? 4.75 million. How do we match the intercept? There's only one thing we use to match the intercept. Riskless zero Risk coupon. Sorry. Exactly. Yeah. Riskless zero coupon bond. Right? And what, what, uh, so we go what, long? 4.75 million, what? Riskless bond. Yeah, but it's uh, face value, correct? Yeah. Sorry. In face value of riskless zero coupon bond with maturity equal to what one year that's right i see some people putting up the one um don't think it's a middle finger so that's good um so um um yeah one year every maturity in this problem is going to be one year because it's time one all right so we've matched it's, that's, that's why this is simple. It's literally, you're just asking yourself, what am I matching? If I'm matching the intercept, it's the riskless zero coupon bond, and I'm matching using the face value. How do I match the original slope? The original slope is minus 3,000. Short 3,000 units of the underlying code. Yeah, yeah that's right, 100% correct, right? This, because the slope is negative, you take a short position in the underlying. And it makes sense, right? Because when gold goes up in value, you are sad. And when you've shorted gold and gold goes up in value, you are also sad, doing the same thing. That's what replication is. It's you're literally recreating the same emotion in a different way. I guess it takes a real nerd in financial economics to relate cash flows to emotion, but in any case. Um, minus short uh, 3,000 units, in this case that's gold, uh, ounces, of gold, right? That's to match the original slope, 100%. What's the third ingredient? Right, so, so far we've matched the level, we've matched the original slope, and then we need to match the kink here. The kink takes the slope from minus 3,000 to minus 1,500. And that's happening, the kink is happening at what? 1,500. So how do we match that? Someone want to tell me? Go ahead. We long 1,500. Yeah. We long 1,500 units 
of call on goal with a strike price of what? It's happening at 1500. So it's a strike price of 1500 with maturity equal to one year. Now, why are we longing 1500? It's because the slope went from minus 3000 up to minus 1500. So that was an increase of 1500. When we have an increase in slope, we go long the call option. When we have a decrease in slope, we go short the call option. So now what's our next ingredient? The fourth ingredient is what? Right, what's the next thing that happens? At 1666.67, what do we need to do? All right, I'll just start saying it. Uh, but anyway, long uh, 1500, because we take the slope from minus 1500 to zero, right? Long 1500 units of call on gold with strike price 1666.67 with maturity equal to one year. So notice, this and this are different calls because they have different strike prices. So now what's the next thing that happens? Well, next thing that happens is gonna require two ingredients, right? We're gonna have one ingredient that's gonna create the jump that happens at 1700. And then we're gonna have another ingredient that creates the change in slope. Because if you look, the slope goes from zero back down to minus 3000. So to create the jump, we use the CNBC. To create the change in slope, we're gonna short call option, right? So we're gonna go long 650,000. Why is it 650,000? Because we had established that our jump was 650,000. Um, units of CNBC on gold with strike price 1,700, and maturity equal to one year. Sixth ingredient is gonna be short 3,000 units of call on gold uh, with strike price uh, 18, uh, 1,700 still with maturity equal to one year. And then finally, we have two more ingredients. We have the change in slope at 1833.33, which is an increase of 1500. And then the final increase in 50, of 1500 in slope at a gold price of 2000. So it's gonna be two long positions and call options. So long 1500 units of call on gold with strike price 1833.33 with maturity equal to one year. And then finally long um, 1500 units of call on gold with strike 2000 with maturity equal to one year as well. And we are done with the replicating portfolio. So again, like, look, this is one where, you know, it is important, like, pra like, practice it once or twice. But to be honest, like, if you do it correctly two times, I feel like it'll be like a bike. You now know how to ride that thing. With the first step, the payoff diagrams, you could, pr like, some people, like, you'll have done it 10 times and it'll still be difficult, right? Um, so it's not like riding a bike. It's maybe like kite surfing or something that looks pr my, my partner kite surfs and like, I'm not ever trying that shit. Like it looks so <laughs> difficult. Um, so I guess that I showed show reveal that some situations like this, I just give up. So, uh, although I don't see really the value of, uh, kite surfing, I'll just take videos of her. That's fine. That's good enough. Um, so yeah, I do see value and value and flexibility. Um, 
Any questions about this? No? All right. Well, um, now we're. Sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, all right. At the, at the very beginning, when yeah. we're starting, yeah. um, and we just um, short the actual units of the underlying asset, but then for every other step, we're shorting or longing units of the call on the yeah. underlying asset. Yep. Yeah. Why? Yeah, that's always. Why? Because, um, well, because uh, the um, underlying asset, it's only for creating slope at, a, uh, at an x-axis value of zero, correct? Okay. Right? And so that's what the underlying does. The underlying has no payoff at zero, but has a slope of one. And so it automatically creates slope at the uh, x equals zero mark in the payoff diagram. By the way, I mean, you could have, like, some people, some people sometimes say, like, well, why did you use an underlying instead of using a call option with a strike price of zero? The answer is those two things are the same. I mean, if there's no dividends. Okay, thank you. So, um, ba -ba boom. All right, well, all we have is our last step now. This was, right, so again, let's think of it as a three-step process. Step one is the really hard step. Understand your project and jot it down like a payoff diagram. Step two, look at the payoff diagram, come up with the recipe, i.e. the replicating portfolio. We just finished that. Step three, take that recipe, go to the Black-Scholes uh, model uh, supermarket and uh, figure out the price of the recipe, which is called valuation via replication. So we just need to do that third step now. And for the purposes of our class, as I said, um, that third step is solely about, are you comfortable using my Black Shoals template? So I'm gonna now go back to sharing my computer screen, but I'll share uh, my Excel file, which has my Black Shoals template. And what we'll do is we'll use that template to value this very specific recipe. Sound good? All right, let's go ahead and do that. Share screen, share the, Share the Excel. So uh, remember, we just need to, like, let's remember. Do not touch anything except for the yellow stuff here. Only the yellow. If you want to sabotage your friend's performance in this class, where they have the file on their computer, go change some formulas. Oh, man, that would be cruel. Do not do that. Um, so I'm just gonna be filling out the numbers. 1,600 was the current price of gold, right? Per ounce. Um, dividend yield, zero. I didn't specify, so just put zero. Um, volatility was 36% per year. Riskless rate was stated as 5% per year. A maturity is one year, right? And now strike price or value that depends on our component. Our first component is long the bond, riskless zero coupon bond. So the, the number we enter here is the face value. The face value was 4.75 million. The second component is the underlying. Remember, I told you guys last time, but just remember, when, you're, when your column is the underlying, you can put in whatever number you want. Just don't put in zero. I'll put in one. It's a random number. It is going to be irrelevant to our answer, okay? Boom. Um, component three was, uh, oh, and I'm, I'll put the positions as well. The position for the bond is just one. The position for the underlying, oh, and I might as well call the underlying what it actually is. It's gold. And it was minus 3,000 ounces of gold was the quantity. What about component three? Component three was a long position in a call on gold. How many positions? It was a long 1,500. Oh, wait. Um, uh, sorry, the strike price was 1,500. And the position was also 1,500. It's a coincidence that those two numbers are the same, by the way. Let's be clear. Um, what about the strike price for the fourth thing? Fourth thing was 1,666.67. It was also a call option. 
and the quantity was still 1500 because it was taking our slope from minus 1500 to zero. What about the next thing? The next thing was matching our jump. So it was a CNBC. Um, it was at 1700 as the strike price. And there was 650,000 of them because you had to create a jump of 650K. Uh, component six was a call option, also at a 1700, um, 1700 strike price. And it was minus 3000 because you were taking a slope of zero and bringing it down to minus 3000. And then 1833.33. And then the next one is 2000. And both of those were long positions, 1500 units. So we're done getting all the, the prices and quantities. And let's, you know, shopping cart style tabulate everything, which was what? Quantity times pick the right price. It's a bond. So I pick the bond plus quantity times price. It's the underlying, so I pick the underlying, plus quantity times call. So I now pick the call. Quantity times, again, it's a call, plus quantity times, well, this is a CNBC, so I highlight the CNBC, plus this times, well, this is a call, so I pick the call, ah, oh, plus this times and we're done right so it's really about this is about org being organized right and being comfortable with the template look you don't need to use my template by the way if you just prefer using the black shoals model every single time go ahead that's fine my guess is it takes more time on an exam than to use my template. But you can also build your own template uh, as well. Okay? I'm just going to press enter and we're going to get our answer. Sound good? 585,549. What is that? That is the present value of cash flows at time one. Now remember, this project had cash flows at time zero and at time one, correct? So the value of the overall project is the sum of the two. Now notice this number, you don't need to discount it by a year because it happens at time one. This number is already discounted. The Black-Scholes formula does the discounting for you. And so what's the present value of the whole project? That's equal to the present uh, cash flow zero plus the present value of cash flow one, and that is equal to 100,000. That was the number that at the beginning we calculated. We found that the best thing to do is to produce 10,000, and that gives you 100,000 right now. Plus the value of what we think will be happening in one year. And so what is the overall project worth? It's worth 685,549. Are folks okay with this? Again, you guys are going to be given more practice problems. That some are already available in the practice final. And you guys are going to have at least two other problems to kind of, um, you know, uh, gain comfort with uh, in the context of the homework. Okay. Um, this basically wraps up uh, what we're going to be doing in class today. Uh, what we're going to do next lecture, at the beginning of lecture, is we're going to do one last example of a problem um, using static replication for corporate flexibility. But it's going to be a problem where the um, implementation of the real option analysis tools is not going to be as clean as the examples we've done so far. The reason I say that the examples we've done so far are clean is because the underlying is an asset that is traded and that has a bunch of derivatives traded on it in real world financial markets. And so what that means is it's much easier to feel confident with this valuation. What we'll do next lecture is we'll do an example of something where the underlying asset isn't traded. So you're doing a bunch of guessing work. 
to figure out how to use the Black-Scholes model and all that stuff. And so the more guesswork you do, the less confident you are in your answer. And so I'm gonna call it a dirtier application. Right, so we're gonna do that at the beginning of next lecture, uh, next week, Tuesday. Sound good? Now there's another thing that I've decided to do. Uh, if you look at my notes and my materials, I cover two different ways to do option pricing in this topic, right? There's the way that we've just done, static replication, but there was also another way called dynamic replication where you use a multi-period binomial model. I have just decided to actually remove this from the course. Um, not just for this year, I'm removing it for future years. Uh, there's a pretty basic reason for that. Is I kind of decided that I thought it was a better idea to do this approach more carefully and I ended up spending more time doing this this year than I did in past years. Um, I just kind of decided like, since the goal is to get you guys to think about extending stuff and more like have this desire to maybe invest in those skills in the future, um, because that could be good for your personal growth down the road, I thought it was more important to go more deep into one than to cover both approaches kind of more quickly, more shallowly. Um, but then of course that brings the question, why did I decide to go more deep in static as opposed to more deep in dynamic? And there's a pretty simple practical reason for that. Static, the stuff that we're doing is closer to being like real world. Meanwhile, with the binomial model, it's like a complete cartoon. So it's like more planet McGill than planet Earth. And so if I'm going to pick one, I might as well pick the one that's closer to planet Earth for you. And that's why I decided to focus on the first approach. But that basically means dynamic replication. It's in your notes. We're not covering it in class. If we don't cover it in class, you can damn well rest assured that it's not going to be on the final exam. It's not going to be on the homework either. Okay, so, you know, that's just there. Look, it's there. You can actually read up on it. Um, I have solutions to the problems posted online as well in the Excel spreadsheets. So, you know, if you're a self-learner, you can kind of go and check it out yourself. Not necessarily a terrible use of your time when you have free time to spare, right? Um, but for this class, I, I just kind of decided like, you know, one of the things I've been learning this semester, just from like asking you guys questions about how you're viewing the course experience and stuff like that, is that maybe actually there's some value um, for like less is more sometimes. And I kind of feel like this is appropriate here. Um, and so what that means is after we do that final example of a dirty static replication next lecture, we're actually going to move into topic three. Okay. Um, doing this is also going to free up a little bit more time at the end of the semester, which is going to give us an opportunity to spend a bit more time where you guys can come to me with any of the pain points that you have in this course. And we can discuss those in a, in a kind of more informal group setting. Maybe that'll be helpful. I don't know. All right. So in any case, uh, that wraps up what we wanted, what I wanted to do for today. Um, I hope you guys have a good remainder of the week and weekend. And uh, I will see you guys next Tuesday. Have a good one.